Okay, professor, let's go back to way before you were a professor. Okay. Let's go back to your childhood in Russia, and I'd like to know where you are as a child and what your family is like. Um, well, I was, I was born and raised in St. Petersburg, um, which was then called Leningrad, um, in Russia, which was then called USSR, so a lot of things have changed. Yeah. Um, and I was, I was raised in a, you know, kind of an absolutely normal family, normal for, you know, Soviet times, uh, in an apartment in... in but not in a, normal in the sense of it being filled with science as a culture. That, 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 that's true. So my, my, uh, my father uh, is a physicist. My grandma and grandpa were chemists. Okay. Um, and and it, it, so indeed. Um, There's a disposition in the family. Yes. Yes. And my way. uncle was a is a physicist as well. Um, so uh, there's definitely was a lot of scientists uh, around me when I was growing up. Uh, also, I would guess the quality of schools in St. Petersburg, Leningrad was quite high. Well, uh, yes and no. So I think, I think in general, you know, education uh, and technical subjects it at least was much higher um, in, in the Soviet Union than, than in the West. Uh, we just, they got, they drilled much more math into us. Um, and and these these were definitely things that that even in a not very good school you just you you had to learn much more. Um, but um, I actually went to a it, it's kind of weird. So I I went to a um, special boarding school for low vision children uh, because um, I I was born with uh, with with a visual impairment reasonably severe and and um, and so and also at that point there were no real visual aids so by the time I got to America it turns out that there are special glasses that you can wear that you can read things and there is a special uh, little monocules that you can see at the board but back back when I was you know in, in a kid in Russia there was no no such things there and so I think my parents were worried that I might not do well in a normal classroom. Yes. And probably they were also worried that I would just get beaten up yes. by uh, by this the you it's know bullied. That, the bullied. Yeah, because you know it's 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 a tough environment, and if you don't see well, then it's, right. it makes it even tougher. Um, and so and so they placed me in the special special uh, school um, for for low vision children where. You know, you'd still get bullied, but you get bullied by also half blind students. So <laughs> it wasn't so bad. They they would miss half the time. <laughs> um, and you said boarding school. Yes, yes. So because Saint Petersburg is a big city, you know, five six million people, and the the school was on the other edge of town, and so um, it was an an hour getting there, and so that's why it was a boarding school most students would go there and, and stay the whole week or maybe half the week. Um, and, uh, but I didn't, I didn't really like that, this whole leaving institution. The, yeah, the, just, the institution or leaving you, the family in the week or all of the above? Oh, well, everything, yeah. And just but in general, just, I mean, if you can imagine, you know, this institutional, you know, Soviet, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there is a lot of, a lot of bad food and a lot of communism involved yeah. all the time and strict discipline and uh, so I, I I didn't like it much at all and so actually I think I started commuting home starting at like age nine. You know, well when had you been placed there? At what age? Seven. 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 School starts at seven, at seven yeah so I think after about two or three years I, I started actually commuting you know you fifteen minute walk, fifteen minute bus, fifteen minute metro, and then fifteen minute walk again. But in the end, I actually enjoyed that, and I especially like the metro. You know, going going into the 
on oh, a train. Oh, how many children in the family? In your family? Uh, two. I have a little baby brother. Okay, so you're the eldest. Yeah, I'm. I'm the oldest. Yes. Um, a big question. You can answer it anyway. What are your parents' ambitions for you? Do you when do you begin to feel that? Um, I, I think, my parents didn't push me that much. I think partly they were worried that because I don't see well, you know, I should be, I should be given some broader, broader, uh, broader uh, leash or longer leash and do things my own way. Also, I think the generation of my parents uh, especially in the sciences, they were. I think now it's called the the the, the tiger parents. Uh, yes. You know, there was definitely something like that in the when I was growing up in the Soviet Union, where the, the parents would really push their kids and make them, you know, learn languages and learn music and learn, you know, this and that and the other and uh, um, and. I think my dad was actually kind of was against that. He oh. felt that that kids should just be kids and not be pushed around. So he was an early American. Yes, I think before so. Before he knew it. <laughs> I, I think no. I think he was definitely he was there was definitely you know he read a lot of he he knew English and so he read a lot of kind of uh, American uh, American literature and he liked it and he he felt like yeah you know just let let the kids be kids something will work out. And so I wasn't really pushed around. I wasn't like, in fact, I, you know, I did not learn how to read until I went to school, mm -hmm. which is completely insane. You know, mm -hmm. you don't learn until, you know, you're seven. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, but he felt that, you know, you just, it's okay. Um, um, so, yeah, no, I, I, I think there was definite i wasn't a good student i was i wasn't a bad student but you know so getting like b's in, in math for example my yes. my father my father was he wasn't particularly upset he but he was like you know just quizzical because he was like hmm yes hmm you know right and uh, you know and you know i i i did i wasn't that i was a bit lazy so yeah. So you're not the first among these interviews, uh -huh. uh, scientists, to right. say that about their childhood. But you know, in a way, it suggests an ability to think in a free roaming way rather than just a directed right. way. Maybe this right. will help you one day as a, a research scientist. But yeah. anyway, as a child, you're not being pushed. Um, I wasn't special in any way at all. Uh -huh. Maybe if I had some sort of a um kind of thing that I did well was um um I wrote good essays. I would always get very good marks on my essays for for kind of literary content. They were all very literary and i but I would also always get the worst marks for the for the grammar huh. so I would never get a very good grade because you know the content was great but the grammar I would make, you know, three three mistakes in every sentence, in every word. So, take us to a point where, and it may not be in while well, you're still there in mm -hmm. Russia. I know you you will leave at fourteen, and we will talk right. about that. But right. until fourteen, is there a point you take fire intellectually, or you begin to read a certain kind of book, or you have a teacher that inspires you? Is there anything in this period of that? Yeah, I think. Uh, frankly, I think I actually, you know, I. I formed as an individual by the time I, I left Russia at 14, I think. Okay. So I, after that, it was all kind of going downhill from there, really. Um, no, I think, the, yeah, I think there was a couple of things. So one is that I, I the one thing that, that, that my parents did try to make me do was to, they, you know, made me take piano lessons. Okay. And um, and the thing there was that I just really liked it, and um, I was lazy at practicing, and I was never any good. But I just really liked it, and I I um, I 
you know, I still play the piano, not very well, but I enjoy it. And, you know, I would, I started to compose and, and just really started to appreciate and enjoy music. And that was, uh, that was something that, you know, made me happy. And it was something that I was, you know, kind of discovered on my own. My, no, nobody in my family was musical at all. Hmm. I, I was told that my grand uncles were, were right. very musical, but I never but met again, any of them. it's not a household filled with music. Right. Not really, no, yeah. So it was like one of those things that was mine um, that I enjoyed. And the other big thing that happened was that uh, my father got interested in, in computer science. Uh, as a physicist, it was something that he was very curious because it could solve some of his problems, so he was he read about it, of course, mm. nobody had any computers, but, but you know, he had a programming calculator and he was so excited about it that he would like show this to me and then he oh. would teach me, he taught me how to program the calculator and, and I, I really liked it. And, uh, and then, um, and then, and then he went to, he was, you know, perestroika happened and he was allowed to go abroad for, for, for conferences and I think from, from Germany he brought in one of those you know, HP programming calculators. Mm. And it was magical and there was all this, you know, there was this manual all in German. None of us knew German, but like I figured out what, how to program this in German without knowing any German. And, um, and, uh, and this would have been one of the few in in Russia, or at least yeah, in, yeah, there wasn't that in, many. In yeah. your environment, that's right, that's right, that's right, and 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 um, and and I remember, and then I really got into this whole, um, uh, com- yeah, I I I I got into this, uh, uh, oh, and then and then and then my father met, I think it was like he he met in the subway. His high school friend, or the, the guy he went to high school with, right. after 30 years, and the guy said, oh, yes, oh, good to run into you. I, you know, my driver was sick, so I didn't take the car this, this time, and I'm, I'm taking the subway, so good to run into you. Um, turns out that he's a big shot, you know, party boss, and the part, and he was, he was, a, uh, he was in charge of, making, you know, rubber boots. He was a chairman of the rubber boot factory. Right. And then the party sent him to to a different factory. And that factory was making um, Soviet Union's first personal computers. Certainly. You know, he didn't know anything about computers, but there he was in charge of a factory. And in, you know, in the Soviet Union, if, if you, if you're in charge of something, you know, you, you share with your buddies. Right. So he said, Hey, you know, I'm, I could have offered you rubber boots last year, but now I I don't have access to that. But I have this personal computers. You want one? Sure. And and my dad said, Yeah, yeah, let's do it. And um, and so I got one of the first Soviet-made personal computers in, in my home through this weird connection. What age are you at this point? I think maybe uh, twelve. I'd okay. say. I think yeah. I think at twelve. And and it it was a revelation. It was. You know, I it didn't have any, it didn't have any programs. It didn't have any games. It had nothing, and um, and it it was also you would it would overheat. So after an hour, it would f- crash. So not only did I had to learn how to program it to do it, to make it do anything interesting, but I also had to do it really really fast because I had to code the the, yes. the program. Also, you couldn't save anything. To to there was no there was no way to save anything. So it's like you talking about the dark ages. Yes. So yes. so you, you turn it on, you type something in, then you know whatever you pro, you program it, you know, and you play with the program. Maybe you you know program a game. You play with the game, but then after an hour or so, it would freeze up, and you know you have to start over again. Okay, time to bring you to America. Uh huh. What brings your family to America? Um, so my, my father was always a little bit of a dissident. Mm -hmm. 
so he was you know he was uh, um, he would go to read some you know forbidden books go to some forbidden art exhibitions and in general just would not cooperate with with the with the party authorities and so he was not really given uh, he was not really given much of uh, you know, his his progress in, in 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 was was limited he was not he, i remember he would get these invitations every year he would get an invitation oh, uh, you know i we would love to come you know invite you to canberra to australia right. for a semester as a visiting you know uh, 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 professor uh, all expenses paid right, right. and of course he couldn't go he couldn't accept it and, and they wouldn't let him accept they, you, they would not let him go because you know you had to have an exit visa you had to have an you would should be allowed to to get out of the country and so he was a pretty you know famous scientist at yes, that point but he but wasn't sound politically he was definitely not sound and so um i think they were thinking of leaving you know earlier you know when i was really young and then but that didn't quite work out and then i think that there was kind of this idea that if there was an opportunity that that might be something that that would be uh that that might be a i think i think my father was in the in the back of his mind there was always the germany in the late 30s there was a lot of good scientists who you know were realizing things are not good mm -hmm. and where they were thinking that maybe they should leave germany mm -hmm. you know especially especially the jewish ones but then they were kind of not quite sure and, and by the time they realized okay this is time it was, it was too, late. too late yes, yes. and things were happening that were very changes were very fast and some were good but some were very Right. Scary. Uh, the level of anti-Semitism, for example, in the late '80s has really risen, risen up. It could have gone different ways. I think in the end, nothing really terrible happened in in the Soviet Union. It kind of broke up in a mm -hmm. reasonably, reasonably controlled way. But it could have been much worse. There could have been some. This was now the late 80s, late '80s. Yes. When he was contemplating. That's right. That's right. Living. And uh, so and so he felt that. You know, and and the window of opportunity might have also closed up. So nobody really knew, like nobody expected this chance that suddenly you could leave. Right. And it wasn't clear how long that window would stay open. Right. And so my father felt that this he will mistake. not make the mistake that those Germans did in the thirties who right. did not get out in time. So he comes to Utah? No, um, so he, what happened was that he had a good, uh, very good uh, colleague and friend um, at UC Riverside who, it was still not very easy to leave. So he, his, his, this friend of his arranged for him a three year visiting professorship position because if only if you leave for three years, were you able to take your family? It, you still had to get a approval from the, you know, the, the the president of the Soviet Academy of Sciences. But you, if if you anything less than three years, you you leave your family behind. But if you could get something for three years, they would, they might allow your family to go with you. And so he got this very extraordinary three-year visiting position. Right. And so we went to, to, to California for that. Okay, let's now meet the 14-year-old, 15-year-old, right, right. Uh, former Soviet resident right, who's right. now in America, in California. Yeah. Uh, he's put in school. Yeah. How's his English? Um, I, knew, I knew one word, <laughs> and then it turns out that it was actually two words, ice cream. <laughs> so I, I doubled my vocabulary. <laughs> you know in the first day of class right. so that was pretty good um it it was it was tough it you know uh, 
a 14 year old I just I just started making friends in Russia you know I was a kind of a lonely geeky kid growing up so it was I was finally happy to have made friends and kind of get my know know myself my way around and kind of travel around by myself and then suddenly I get placed in this new weird world with a language I don't understand also it was a big change between a you know, six million city you know quite cosmopolitan yeah. with a lot of you know subways and whatever to a tiny little uh, Calif- southern California town with no sidewalks right. um, and so it was it was a time of adjustment I was always looking where you know where where is the city where are we going to the city and, and this is it this was the city just this the, this you know rose you know just ha- one one story houses as far as that I could see how are we gonna get you as a 14 year old knowing two words in English to even qualifying to go to university in the ne- these four years I, is there some magical moment is it a new determination to learn no it just i i think this is just your standard i mean it's a standard immigrant thing you know that you just have to figure this out it's not you know and my family also the same thing well, my father knew some english but the rest of my family we didn't didn't know anything and you know we needed to somehow figure this out and um and and you know it I, it didn't seem like a big deal because you know it was reality it's reality and like it in the soviet union right life is tough so this was just continuation of that kind you of know fun. you just have to do it and, and some things were were really quite amazing i i i was not happy with america i was not happy with the fact that you know that that there was there was you know everybody was driving and I, I couldn't drive and so I but there were some things that really were absolutely magical they um, my my dad mentioned in the school that you know I don't see well and suddenly all of these you know assistive services people was oh oh okay we will assign this 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 person to you so I, I I got I still remember mrs. Simpson mrs. Simpson from from the you know um, uh, from uh, what is it, ha- handicap services or something? This big woman with a huge smile. You know, in Russia, people don't smile, right? So there was like, I, I, it was a big thing for me, just this huge smile, and she's like, "Okay, we will figure this out. Don't worry." And so the first thing she did was she got me glasses where I could actually read normal print for the first time in my life so that was quite something then she got me a a spyglass so I could see the board also that's something I never managed to to do to see before Um, and then she would get you know she she took my little Russian English dictionary and she blew it up so it was like this big so I had to carry it with it in a backpack, but you know the the letters were this big, but I could actually see it, and um, and she taught me like you know how to cross the street and where to kind of how to catch buses and how to find you know house numbers, um, and she was just so optimistic and so positive, and it just it was so good and. It was it was really something. I felt, you know, this this country, you know, they, it was they, transformative. It was. In, I think it life. was. I think it was. It, I ha- I have to get you to the point where I be- begin to believe you're going to be a scientist. Where what does it take to get you there? I I don't think there. I think it's all just a series of accidents. I don't think there is any. It can be accidents. Yeah. But there still has to be a time when, first of all, you have to decide in a university. You will right. have learned at some point. You have to pick a major. Yeah. You have to begin to shape your future. How does that happen? I, so I think, so I was, you know, since the time I got this computer back, and I was, I was, I was hooked. I would just, I would do, 
I would do, I remember back, even back in, back in Russia, you know, you know, you go, I got sick a lot. So, you know, you get sick is great because you don't go to school, which I hated. But then for two weeks, you don't have to do PE. You don't have to do physical education. So I remember I was sitting there, everybody else was running like crazy around in circles. And I was sitting there relaxing and reading this book about the PDP-11 assembly language, which is the most boring, weird, strange thing. I don't remember why I was reading it, because I, you know, I didn't have a PDP a computer, so it was completely you know, academic, but I just loved it. I loved the idea of it. And so, um, and, and um, yeah, even in Russia, I, I you know, I, I would, I, I coded up some crazy thing and then okay. I send it out and I, uh, you know, to some contest and I got, I think, second prize for like, you know, this whole Soviet Union, you know, programming contest. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so there was, uh, you know, I was doing that and then going to America, again, I, you know, didn't have the English, didn't have many friends, but I had this amazing computer. Well, so the family obviously got the, the latest computer once you arrived? No, not really. I think I was actually, I would actually go to my dad's office and I would just okay. play around with his computer. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, I would totally monopolize his computer. He couldn't use it at all because I was always on it. Uh, but I, and I would, I, I was writing, I was coding things. I, I actually even wrote uh, like a program that I would give out a shareware to kind of gave it out to you know put it on online and then at and sort of 15 16 yeah something like that yeah that. yeah and then i would say okay you know if you like it please send me 20 dollars or send me 10 dollars and a and a postcard from me where you live so i got a lot of postcards and i got you know i got some money i got maybe like 5 600 dollars are are, are counselors noticing this ability or no, I don't Still think so. Still no direction. No. I mean, it's it's your own curiosity. Yeah, that's, yeah. I'm that's just pushing you. I was just having fun, and I think, I think if I had if I stayed in Russia and I have had my friends and other things, I wouldn't have been so focused on on computers. Like it was really just that I was all by myself right. and I didn't have anyone to talk to. It. So I think it might have been something like that. Well, a lucky accident. Lucky, lucky accident, or. Unlike I don't who knows maybe it would be better if I had <laughs> spent my 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 teen years hanging out with friends. But maybe the data world would not be better. Maybe. So so I'm going to put you in university uh -huh. at Utah probably because your father moved there. Yeah. So exactly. So my father moved to Utah and it was you know um, you know I I applied uh, I applied to various uh, universities but. You know, it 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 was it was kind of yeah. So I applied to, for example, in you know Carnegie Mellon University, mm -hmm. which is you know, famous for computer science. But then you know we looked at how much it costs. It's like oh. one of those like, is that is that a phone number or is that a price? You know, right. and then you know University of Utah was a great deal. It was something like you know five hundred dollars per semester or something. So right? economics sent you to totally, the University of Utah. and it, it was it was a fine. It, it was a fine university, and um, and also I, I, while in high school, I would, you know, they, they had a very nice summer program, which was which was wonderful that I took, and there were they also held uh, programming contests, and also in high school here in Utah, actually, I had a very nice computer science teacher. So in in this high school, there was actually a computer science oh, okay. in the high school, okay. and so and the computer and the teacher realized that I already knew everything and right. so she just let me just play around with all their equipment and so I I you know I put the school on the internet and I was like this is administering their 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 computers and 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 she just let me do whatever I wanted Mrs. Green she was great this is the story of your life people are letting you do pretty much yeah what you want yeah it was wonderful I just they just just you know whatever do do whatever yeah so and the university, which is a, an economic bargain, is where you yeah. go here in Utah. Yeah. But um, when do you find a special, well, you have to f choose a major at some right. point. No, no, I always knew I wanted to come. At that point, okay. it was clear I wanted to do computer science. Okay. Uh, and, and, uh, and uh, yeah, it was up and, you know, and the, fir the first 
day of classes. I remember distinctly I had, you know, two computer science classes the first day of university. And I just, after the, in the end of the first day, I remember like, I can't believe this is so amazing. This is exactly what I, I learned so much in just the one day, and it's just exactly what I wanted to do. And so this, this is, is now the so early happy. 90s, uh, just a place I Yeah, started. yeah, mid, mid uh, yeah, so I finished, finished high school in, in 93, I think, and so yeah, so mid 90s. So where are we in commu computer knowledge at this point? It's a big question, but I mean, in general, now that you're entering a more right. directed right, professional, right, right. A path. What is known, and what is making you curious? Well, so I actually another thing what, that happened is that you know because of, there was nothing else to learn in, in high school. Even when I was actually finishing up in high school the last year or two, I decided I'm just going to go to the local university and and see maybe they'll give me something to do. And it was uh, it was quite something. I, I was I was quite. Uh, um, a weird but kind of brazen kid at mm -hmm. that point, I guess, because I just, you know, I went to the computer science department, I went to the kind of the, 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 the main office, you know, I come in and I say, take me to your chairman, you know, this is a Russian <laughs> accent. And, and you know, they, they take me to the chair of the department, and I say, I want to do research. <laughs> and bless his heart, Tom Henderson, who was the chair at the yeah. time, he's like, Okay, weird Russian kid. <laughs> sure, you know I don't care. You're still in high school. Yeah, why? I, you know, you can do this, this or the other. Or I have this, uh, I have this old robot sitting around. Why? You know, you want to play with that? You can play with that. Right. And um, and yeah, and again, it, he just he let me do stuff. He would meet with me every week. It was absolutely, absolutely fantastic. So I'm going to call him your first mentor. I guess so. I guess well. I guess my father was really my uh, yeah, first mentor on kind of explaining to me how these things are, and then uh, and then yeah, and then and then uh, and then Tom was uh, yeah to yeah let again let me let me play around with things. There was a robot. The robot would go around and he would you know I'd make it pick up trash. We even you know s send it to some competition in Seattle, and you know we did reasonably well there. Um, so yeah, so by that time I was already interested in in this in this direction, and, and the transition to university that is virtually done. I mean, you're yeah, you're already technically it was yeah. I didn't know anything, but I was already I already knew people, so that was kind of it. Was make sense to just just hang around and like all the graduate students you knew me already and I was I was in the, in the on, on, on campus the whole, all the time um, or to eat all the free food they would have yeah is the is the term artificial intelligence beginning to circulate around you at this point or it's not an important concept yet um for you artificial intelligence was definitely something that I was very interested in from the very beginning okay. At that point in time, mid '90s, it was a it was a bad word. Artificial intelligence was something that people tried, at and failed. Uh. Um, I was still very much interested in the idea, and that's kind of what got me to computer vision because I thought, you know, why was artificial intelligence not not so much uh, was kind of, you know, it was an AI winter at that time. And one of the reasons that I could see was that there was no real way to figure out if it was doing anything. And so I thought, okay, maybe we need to have some sort of a type of AI where you could really see if it's doing something. And so, and so, you know, natural language seems like one of those things. You know, the Turing test. So, you know, you, if if a computer can answer questions for you or it can converse with you, then you know it's actually really working. Okay. But then I thought, okay, no, this is this is too complicated. This is too hard. Uh, then robotics seems like another um, thing that okay, if you can get robot to do something for you, then you know it's actually working. But again, robotics, you know, you have to deal with hardware. It seems also hardware breaks all the time. And so then I kind of 
realize that you know vision it's it's something that it's it's hard to fool you know you you know give computer an image and it, if computer needs to reason about the image and and find objects for example and it it's if it's actually can do that that we, you know, we know it's actually doing something hard to fool it's not as hard as language we know that you know most animals have vision only us have language mm -hmm. um and also i felt like being poor sighted myself mm -hmm. i have an insight because given how bad my vision is mm -hmm. i shouldn't i shouldn't be able to you know deal with the world as well as i do and the fact that i can actually still you know navigate and get get people from place to place recognize people suggests that there's something interesting going on mm. and that because kind of in my brain that interesting is kind of slow enough that i can almost sense what it's doing mm. i thought huh maybe i have a kind of an inside track there and that's why you know early on i started get, getting interested in computer vision this is while an undergraduate even yeah yeah beginning of undergraduate yes 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 okay that's right and right. and you know yeah we'll get you to graduate school mm -hmm. very soon but still as an undergraduate um it's probably a word you'll you'll uh, re uh resist but you seem you're precocious possibly in setting a field already as an undergraduate mm -hmm. that in fact is where you will do your work yep yeah, that's kind of unusual. I agree. I agree. Um, are you getting the uh, both the, the uh, technology to work with that is helping you advance these ideas? Are you getting teachers that are helping you in computer vision questions? Or are you again pretty much doing it by yourself? Oh no, I think I mean first I'm not really doing much myself I'm okay. still just learning right okay uh, I mean I'm coding some silly things but it's I'm not advancing science in any okay. way um, no I, I, I well, there's definitely been even actually thinking back you know my father back when I was nine or ten he was telling me oh you know there's this new interesting area I, you know read in, in, in scientific American called you know object recognition Really? Yeah, that it's it's very neat because you know you get the computer to recognize objects for you and you know and he for some reason he thought it was connected to physics so he thought it was part of physics but he was telling it to me and so I you know I got thinking about this early on but then uh, Tom Henderson uh, yes. this the the, the the at at University of Utah he was a he was a uh, he was a computer vision researcher and. Uh, uh, Bill Thompson, another computer vision researcher, basically they let me play around in, in their lab and, and, and they, you know, they taught me a lot of things and they're graduate students too. And so I definitely, I, I, I got immersed in that culture and I, you know, I, I was aware of, you know, what things were happening and aware that, you know, basically not much was happening really. It was, right. it was... Uh, you know, it was this field that was still kind of waiting for its heyday. But uh, but I was definitely um, by the end of my undergraduate. Yeah. It was clear that computer vision was was something that I was interested in. Okay, now you have to decide in graduate school. Yeah, where are you going to go? Um, so I wasn't. I definitely wanted to go to graduate school because I felt that. There, I basically took all the classes I could from University of Utah, including graduate classes. Mm -hmm. So basically, I think I basically f did the whole catalog. Which is in a way which you did in high school on the way to college. Kind of, yeah. And still, I thought that there would be more things that I wanted to learn. So I wanted to, 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 to go to graduate school, but actually I didn't want to get a PhD. I felt that I wasn't good enough to mm. to be a scientist, but I just wanted to learn more stuff, and then I could go and and you know apply it somewhere. Um, but of course, if you if you do a if you do a master's, you have to pay yourself for you know for it yourself. But if you get a, if you apply for a PhD, 
you can get a fellowship. Economics again. Exactly. So, I trickily applied for a PhD. Uh, but because I was sure that, you know, I, wouldn't, I wasn't good enough, uh, I applied to like 20 places. 20, yeah, sent out 20 applications. Strangely got to pretty much all of them. Wow. Very, very, I was very surprised by that. And, um, and then, yeah, and then, and then um, for you know, various reasons, uh, ended up in, uh, in Berkeley. Would you have said at that point, of course, Berkeley is very well positioned now in the developing computer world. Yes, yes. But is it particularly well positioned in computer vision issues? Um, now it is, but back back in the day, you know, my my who you know the person who became my advisor, Jitender Malik, you know, he was he was actually he was a young kid by then. You know, I when I talk, asked my undergraduate advisors, said, yeah, you know, you can go to Berkeley and and play around with this y young kid, Jitendra. And I realize now, yeah, he's he he was younger than I am now when when I joined his lab. So he was a young kid. Now he's like the the. the most important person in the in our field, but back then he was just starting. Really, um, I, I don't know. I just it wasn't. It was again kind of just a very natural decision, not not very scientific. I, I I didn't I didn't feel like MIT was. I didn't feel like the atmosphere of MIT or Stanford was 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 that good, and you know, and uh, CMU was a, a great place, but, but I wasn't that excited about the, the talent, right, so. Right. You'll get there eventually. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. But, but for graduate. Exactly. At Berkeley, you know, the bay, the, the, the hills, it was nice. Yeah. yeah. Now, of course, because I've read about you, I know that I'm, the next question for you should not be, what was your thesis? Because you start doing work that gets noticed and advances the field while the graduates Right. Can you tell me about a, a couple of those insights and in the papers that you were beginning to present? Well, again, I, I, I really think that my thesis was basically a failure in that I, I, got, I, got, a, uh, I got very lucky in the very beginning. Okay. And I came up with a very, very simple, just trivially simple algorithm to synthesize visual texture. So you have a piece of visual texture and you want to create more of it. And it turned out that something that I read back when I was a kid in Russia about synthesizing natural sounding text uh -huh. uh, turned out that using that as an analogy to pixels, I could just have a very simple way of synthesizing good looking textures. And so, and that I did my second year in grad school. And, uh, and that year is what, 70, uh, I mean, 96? 98, 98, 98, 99, okay. yes. And, and, um, and that, that became very famous, and, and because the results were just so much better, even though the, this algorithm was just absolutely trivial. What is the term for that insight? This is, uh, well, this is basically this, this idea of, you could say that it's basically the idea of using data-driven methods. So instead of, instead of somehow distilling information from, from, from the data and then kind of synthesizing from that, you basically just copy pieces from the data, it's kind of, a, I call it, you know, postmodernism in computer yeah. science, right? You kind of, you just copy what people have, or what, what other in previous images had, had, have had, and put the, put it in a different way, and that, there you go. So, very, very simple idea. It's just that nobody has tried it, and, and the results were surprisingly good. And so, that paper got really famous, and, um, and then, after that, I basically didn't do anything for three years because, you know, how do you top that? <laughs> you know, and so I was actually very stressed out because I was trying to do something really cool and nothing was working. So actually, most of my PhD, I was very stressed out because like I felt like I needed to top my first paper and it was, it was very hard. 
what was the, uh, your PhD on? However disappointing it may be to you. Well, so it was basically you know that first that paper issue. plus kind of some continuation of that for 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 applying similar approaches to human emotion uh, because you know my advisor told me you know by at, at by the you know by the end of my fifth year my advisor said okay you know it, maybe it's time to graduate right. don't worry. Don't try to you know do something really great. You know, remember PhD is really the you know it's the beginning, right. not the it's end. It's the union card. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yes. By that time, of course, I also kind of realized, okay, maybe I don't want to leave with a master's. Maybe I want to stay around. You know, I had very nice office mates. The advisor was very nice. You know, I had a seat next to the window. Right. So again, I was reason you know i was thinking about going off to to industry at that point and then i laziness kind of kicked in and i just said oh, i'll just i'll just try to finish this PhD. now let's pause on this question of the decision of a, a career in industry mm -hmm. or academia mm -hmm. how do you make that decision again you stumble into it uh, yeah as yeah. you said that you decide i want to stay i might as well do a phd yeah i won't did you think you might then go to industry, or were you now thinking, okay, an academic career is... No, I I was not sure. I really didn't know. Like, yeah, I, I once I decided that I might as well stay around for a PhD, I was still not, had no, no real plans for the future. And I know a lot of people, including some of my students, they really have like a right. long-term 20-year plan, and I, 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 I was definitely not that good. I, I really had no plan at all and things just kind of happened. You know, I after after this paper that I presented on texture synthesis, um, you know, one, you know, famous professor came up to me and say said, Oh, I really like your work. Would you like to do a postdoc in my lab in on Oxford? Huh. And I'm like, well, you know, this is only my second year, so I guess, you know, I you know not now, but maybe okay. eventually. Um, but then I remembered this, and then by the time I was uh, finishing, I, I emailed this professor, Andrew Zisserman, and said, remember, three years ago, mm -hmm. you offered me a postdoc position in your lab. Well, <laughs> how about now? And to his credit, Andrew owned up to it, even though, you know, it was much later than he expected and and he said yeah sure come and for me it was just you know going to england oxford beer it sounded really fun so In intellectually not to interrupt the beer uh -huh. but intellectually um what was the lab focused on at oxford it was actually also a great place to be at that lab at that time because at that point they were just starting to kind of transition from the kind of tra traditional things that they were doing in, in geometry to object recognition and also doing a lot of this kind of data-driven things that, that I was also very interested in. And so it was actually, in retrospect, just a perfect place mm -hmm. to go uh, to kind of soak up that atmosphere. And also a lot of very good people were in, 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 in Andrew Zisserman's lab at that time, and I got to meet them, and, and, and it was it was, uh, I mean, it was really, even if at Berkeley, it was a golden time to be at Berkeley. So again, I was super lucky to be right. at Berkeley um, when I was, because a lot of my, you know, PhD brothers, older PhD brothers, was were doing some really fantastic things, and learning from them has been just super, super useful for me. And it was again kind of this this golden era, and then going to Oxford when people like Joseph Civic was there and uh, Mark Evernham and, and Andrew Fitzgibbon, all of them just happened to be in that lab in Oxford. And, uh, and again, I was just very lucky to, to soak up that atmosphere. Uh, but you don't stay. I mean, that's just for a postdoc. Uh, for a postdoc, year. for a year, yes. And then you go to uh, your next birth. Well, yeah, so then... While all of that was happening, again, I was 
you know, I wasn't sure what I was going to do after the postdoc because, okay, I go to England. That was my, you know, one year plan, go to England mm -hmm. and try the beer and hang out with the, with the folks there. And then I get another email that says, oh, by the way, you know, you, I, I hear you might be graduating. Uh, would you like to apply to Carnegie Mellon to, for a professorship? And this was, again, completely eye-opening for me because I never thought of myself as a professor at all. Mm. But, yeah, if somebody is asking me, why not? And so, again, I, you know, I applied for, for, for a tenure track assistant professorship yeah, at various universities and, and, uh, and, and yeah, and got, a, got, a, got an offer from, from Carnegie Mellon. How long will you be there at Carnegie Mellon? What is Nine it? years. Nine years. Yeah. Um, is this the period when just the phrase big data is beginning to circulate? Uh, have I gotten the time yeah, right? Yeah, some, something like that. So, so when I was, I think my PhD was maybe one of the first that used data-driven okay. methods, which was kind of precursor to big data. Big data kind of happened maybe five, eight years later. But yes, something like that. And it's happening while you're at Carnegie Mellon. That's right, right that's right, that's right. Um, I've interviewed other people in mm -hmm. the series who, who thought of big data in terms of text, right? But right. you're thinking in terms of image. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. And so that, that we were, yeah, we were pushing for images to be, to be the really the big data because. Uh -huh. Okay, text is text, but text, you know, you, you take all of Wikipedia, you can, you can basically store it on a, on a thumb drive, right? With, with, with images or, and videos, you know, it's, that's really the big data. And, um, and at that point in computer vision and computer graphics, people were still not very open to that uh, direction. And so, again, it was very lucky that I got to meet some, a few people that were kind of, on my wavelengths, one, you know, uh, some people in Oxford, like Joseph Civic, and also uh, I, through, through, through them, I met uh, uh, another wonderful researcher, uh, um, uh, Antonio Teralba from MIT, and the kind of the few of us were like, yeah, you know, we need, we need to get the data in, the data into this. Because there isn't time to develop this fully, would you mind setting the table in terms of where we are, and you're a major participant in mm -hmm. getting us here, where we are in terms of what we know about big data and the visual and what the applications are starting to be. Just a kind of... So I think, I think the big story okay. in computer vision, right. uh, you know, for the first 30 years was really the idea that we needed to come up with algorithms that would go from the pixels to understanding. And a lot of effort and a lot of, you know, sweat and toil has been spent on that story. And something that a few of us were, were starting to uh, understand in, 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 you know, early 2000s was that the data was a very important, a crucial part of the equation, that it was maybe even more important than the algorithms. The fact that when you're looking at something, when you're looking at a scene, it's not just the pixels of that scene that you're seeing. It's not just uh, this particular scene. It's also that you're making connections to all the other scenes of that type that you have seen in your life. Right. So your, your previous experience, your memory, the data that you have been exposed to, you know, for whatever, 20, 30 years of your life, all comes into play. And that it might be because of this that, that computers are so, so have find this problem so hard because the computers come to this as in with tabula rasa you know they don't yeah. know anything they haven't lived around they haven't seen all the data so yeah. for them this is just completely new and so the few of us were saying you know if we can just give the computer 
as much visual experience as we give to human kids, mm -hmm. maybe the problem will become much simpler. And and indeed, it turned out that this this was correct. That that a lot of problems become much much simpler if if you use a lot of data. And also, algorithms turn out to not need to be that complicated anymore because the data kind of takes over and the data tells you the right answer. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.